first meeting of the Forsyth County Board of Education to order. Do I, we have before us an agenda? Do I, an agenda? An agenda? Do I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Motion by Tom and a second by Mike. All in favor? Okay. And now we have uh, executive session for advice from legal counsel, student disciplinary tribunal personnel, and student educational. Records. Do I have a motion to go into executive session? So moved. To the February 21st meeting of the Forsyth County Board of Education. Do I have a motion to come out of executive session? So moved. Second. On uh, motion by Tom, second by Mike. All in favor? Do I have a motion to uphold tribunal decision 23-123? So moved. Second. Motion by Lindsay, second by Tom. All in favor? Do I have a motion to deny student out of district 517 and 519? So moved. Second. Motion by Mike, second by Tom. All in favor? And do I have a motion to approve personnel B1 through 3 and C1 through 24? So moved. Motion, second. Motion by Tom and a second by Wes. All in favor? Okay, I'd like to welcome everybody tonight. If we could all stand, we will have the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And now we'll have uh, recognitions with Mitch Young. We're right down there. Are we? <clears throat> oh, great. Identifier, right in front, spot. We got some good recognitions tonight. We are going to start out with a student to be recognized tonight. Aria Thacker, come on down here. <laughs> Aria is being uh, honored tonight. She was the Forsyth County winner of the Middle School Essay Contest. 21st Annual Metropolitan North Georgia Water Planning District Middle School Essay Contest and over 600 participants whose essays focused on impacts to water quality and quantity in the metro Atlanta region in the face of more intense cycles of droughts and floods. I hope you found a solution. <laughs> uh, mom and Dad are here tonight, is that yeah. right? My mom is here and my dad. Uh, stand up, Mom and Dad. <laughs> Dr. O, I think it's here from her school. Good to see you, Dr. O. She's not here, I don't believe, tonight, but her teacher, I know, is very proud, Ms. Karen Francis. So, hired in 2001 as a teacher at Chester T. Elementary School. She was an assistant principal at Sawney and at Midway. She's now the principal at Chester T. And she is the mother of great principals. We have a crew of them here tonight <laughs> that are all part of her family tree. Let me read a few things. Why don't you come down here with me while I read these, Dr. Tennis? <laughs> Dr. Polly Tennis, everybody. <laughs> going to read all the pages that we have here tonight, but I'll read, a, I'll read a few tidbits. Our principal, Dr. Polly Tennis, consistently makes our school a place that teachers, staff, students, and families want to be. She creates a positive environment with her welcoming, caring, supportive, kind, and caring demeanor. Dr. Tennis's door is always open, and she's always willing to listen to others and give support in any way. Students are welcomed by name. They are personally complimented by Dr. Tennis for their positive choices. She invites them into her office to have lunch together with her and, and allows them to choose special treats such as books and stuffed animals that are just day brighters. It gets down on a, on, on a child's level in order to share a kind word and greeting. 
she shares, smiles, and so much fills our students with so much joy. She finds a way to make sure that we feel valued, loved, and supported through words, treats, and time. Recently, Jesse was, distinguished, was recognized as a distinguished PBIS school, and this is because of the positive supports that Dr. Tennis has implemented at Chesney. She engages and contributes in wonderful ways to help our students, staff, and families feel loved, supported, accepted, and valued. I think there's a theme there. Dr. Bearden states that students don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Dr. Tennis leads by this quote. Dr. Dennis stresses the importance of being intentional and in our delivery to students. She knows every child can learn and she believes in every child. She is positive, calm, a problem solver, taking care of her students and staff needs. She is a true, a, a true role model of our chastity vision of being a responsible, respectful problem solver, soaring to success. I guess you get the, you get the <laughs> Congratulations. principal that worked for her and she kind of put you out there in the principal ranks to the family tree right and then raise your hand if you're married to this wonderful woman <laughs> We are going to turn things over to Mr. Keith Sargent, the principal at DeSanta Middle School. He and his team are going to deliver this month's Superior Spotlight. Trusting me with technology <laughs> is not the smartest. Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak to you all. Um, one thing that I did want to say before we get started is just to thank you. Uh, for your support, as well as the trust to serve the students, staff, and families of DeSanta Middle School. Um, this evening, I am joined by my wonderful leadership team and then um, three amazing students that are behind me who I can't wait uh, for you guys to hear about the wonderful things that they have to share with you all um, about DeSanta Middle School. And so, um, one of the things that um, one of the things that we wanted to share with you all tonight about about spotlighting the things that are going on at our school is our period of time that we call Connect and Thrive. And this is, is essentially a flex time period for us and our, and our students. And the, the goal here, the focus for us was with, with almost 80% of our students uh, riding the bus, um, which is about, <clears throat> excuse me, 900 students riding the bus to and from school every day. We had three main focuses with this flex time program. The first focus was for us as a school to connect with our students. Uh, outside the academic day. And so, of course, our teachers already do a magnificent job of connecting with our students during the academic day, but we wanted to set a time, a specific period for our teachers to connect with our students outside of that academic day. The second part of, of our flex time or Connect and Thrive is for students to have the opportunity for remediation um, as well as enrichment. We feel like that's important to provide students with the opportunity built in the school day to relearn material they may not have gotten the first time and then for uh, students that may need extension when they have learned it. And third, and form our third focus for us was to um, focus this work on the work that we're doing in our building related that back to our vision and, and, and mission. And so um, we want to have students be successful uh, by design, not, not by chance. And, and this is why we feel like this program is very important for us and, and our students here at DeSanta Middle School. And so um, I believe this quote has been said here in this forum before, but I just uh, think it's a great quote about what we think connection is at DeSanta Middle School. And I think Brene Brown captures this beautifully when she says connection is the energy that exists between people when they feel seen, heard, and valued. And that's what we hope that our students walk away with each and every day with our uh, Connect and Thrive time at DeSanta Middle School. 
We know that our vision and mission uh, as a district is to create a safe, connected, thriving um, learning community for all, and that's the same vision and mission that we have at DeSanta Middle School, is we want to create a connected and thriving professional learning community. And we've even named our flexible period uh, Connect and Thrive in, in recognition of that work. And our mission, just like the district's mission, which is aligned, is to deliver an unparalleled education for all students to succeed. And then our belief systems, and this was a belief that was brought forward by Principal North and the great work that she did there uh, at DeSanta before my arrival, but um, all dragons collaborate, create, innovate, persevere, and inspire. And so um, in a moment, I'm going to have Ms. Bowie come up. She's one of our assistant administrators, and she's gonna, we're going to dive a little bit deeper into what this work actually looks like at DeSanta Middle School. Hi, good evening. Good evening. So um, as Mr. Sargent said, with our Connect and Thrive, we wanted to be very intentional and have students have these extra opportunities for academic and non-academic um, extra help during the school day. Um, as 80% of our students are bus bound, only 20% can typically participate in any of our help sessions or our clubs. So we made sure to put our Connect and Thrive during the school day. And it's during our sixth period. So um, this kind of just gives you a little um, overview of what their week looks like. On Monday is what we call our forecasting day, and that's where students are with their homeroom teacher, and they are able to decide what extra help they need, what enrichment areas they want to go to, or what clubs they want to participate in that week, and they go ahead and sign up for that then. And then on Tuesdays, we have priority days for our ELA and science teachers so that students are able to go to all of the subjects they need throughout the week. We limit priority days to only two subjects. So Tuesday is ELA and science. They get first dibs. On Wednesday, it's math and social studies. And on Thursdays, it's Spanish and connections. And then Fridays are our fun days and our club days. Um, our clubs, as you know, over the last few years with social distancing and virtual learning have really dwindled and we haven't been able to have that as much. And so now I'm proud to say with Connect and Thrive, we have around 30 clubs that are offered to our students. So um, now we have 100% that can participate in those 30 clubs rather than just 20%. Okay, and I'm going to let um, Ms. Maddox go over some data with you. Hi, thank you for having us tonight. So in addition to the goals of helping our students thrive inside the classroom, another big part of this is helping ensure that all the students in our building feel connected to each other, to our school, and to the adults in our building as well. So after um, full implementation of Connect and Thrive at the beginning of the year, after doing that for about three months in November, we um, asked our students a few questions. Some of that was open-ended for them to just give some feedback about mm -hmm. Connect and Thrive. What's working? What do you like? What would you want to change? And so our leadership team, our guiding coalition, then used a lot of that information to make some changes for second semester to honor and recognize that student voice. So what you see here, some of the other things that we drilled in a little bit further, we asked them to rate um, whether they agreed or disagreed with these three statements that you see here on the screen. So I feel connected to the school and the to my school and the people here. And that was rated a 3.66 out of five. Five was strongly agree. Um, I feel supported by adults, so teachers, administration, staff at DeSanta Middle, that was a 3.64. And then I feel supported by other students at DeSanta was a 3.53. So this was just really good information for us to get a baseline of where we're starting. Um, and again, after having implemented Connect and Thrive for a few months, just to sort of see where we are. And then we drilled in a little bit more looking at specific connections within the building. So we asked our students to put a name to that student and that adult connection. Um, it's easy to say, yeah, I feel connected. Yes, I feel supported. But when you have to put a name to it, you're just a little bit more intentional. So what you see here for each grade level, um, these are the students, or this data represents the students who were unable to identify either an adult or a student connection in the building. So they responded with, I don't know, or I don't have anyone. 
So what then we did with that information was shared that with our grade level teachers who know these students and see them every day um, so that they could be a little bit more intentional with their interactions with those kids. So looking at you know, the ways that they're partnering kids for um, group work, their seating charts, any little thing that <clears throat> excuse me, they could do to be creative to help those students foster connections with each other and then also thinking about themselves and what they are doing during Connect and Thrive Time specifically in addition to in their academic classes, these are students that they could then prioritize to come see them, to provide that academic support as an entry point for a connection, and then also students that they can pull or request for um, those fun activities or club activities on Fridays. So of course, we're happy to see that the vast majority of our students were able to identify, excuse me, identify a connection, um, but we're really looking forward to issuing this again next month to hopefully see some growth um, from, from what we saw at our first um, administration of the survey. And now I'll turn it over to Mr. Starr. Can I ask a quick question? Oh, of course. How many, um, how, what's your population of students? We have about 1,200 students. Oh, yes, ma'am. So So looking at sixth grade here, we had five students who were out of, out of the sixth grade, which is just over 400. We had five students who weren't able to identify an adult. We had nine who weren't able to identify a student. And then we had four who weren't able to identify either. I mean, I know this is baseline data, but mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's really good, you know? And it's great yes. that you can take this and then connect those kids. You, I mean, you can identify this is, you know, it's not 100 kids. That right. You, have, you know, so right. this is easy to manage and you can just build upon it. This Absolutely. Is great. And when we shared it with teachers, of course, we, we included the student name so they could then drill in. And so our hope is that when we issue this again next month, many of these students' names hopefully have come off that list because of the way that our teachers have been intentional and in then trying to connect them um, with themselves or their peers. Good evening. Thank you for having us. Um, so when we uh, started devising this plan and going over this new uh, initiative, rolling it out to teachers and everything, of course, we look at it and we um, get feedback and things. But most importantly, we want to hear from the biggest clientele that we serve, and that's our students. So I, um, hearing the impact that um, the Connect and Thrive has with them is important on the success of this. So we did invite a uh, few of our students to come and share how this initiative is rolling out this year and how it has impacted them. But I do want to say, first of all, thank you to the families for bringing them here this evening. So thank you for that. And I do want to start by introducing Tegan. Hi. Hello. Hi. Um, so my name is Tegan. I'm from during Thrive and Connect on Monday, our uh, teachers do a really good job of helping the students to plan out like the week that we have and like our how we need to study for like tests and quizzes. So if we have a test on Friday, um, on Wednesday or Tuesday, we can go to a help session and study for it and do good on that test. So um, Thrive and Connect is really about the name, so we get to connect with our teachers, but also thrive into our school, our grade, and um, socializing with our friends and our teachers. What um, grade are you in? Seventh. And you don't have any notes, by the way, no. right? <laughs> did a great I cannot job. speak without notes, so that's awesome. <laughs> well done. Thank you. Next up, we have Mateo to share with you. Hello. My name is Mateo. And I feel like Thriving Connect is a great time to teach you, you responsibility. And it's a very organized way in which you plan everything for the week. Like Tegan said, you might have a test. And teachers do a great job by helping you organize you and your learning throughout the week to make the best grade possible in that grade. But I also feel like it's a very good way by learning with other students and new students because in your classes, you normally just have a few number of students, and in Thrive and Connect, you get to be with more people and get to know more people throughout the classes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And from Parker. Parker has a trophy, man. Oh. Morning, or afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Parker. 
Uh, and I brought this trophy with me. So trophies resemble win and like, yeah, winning stuff. And you know what else is a win? Thrive and Connect. <laughs> it's a major win across many different areas. Um, it just helps so many students out in um, helping them to do with schoolwork, just to have a little brain break, which is a huge one after like a really, like a lot of classes ahead. It's six periods, so it's towards the end of the day. Um, and so it's just amazing to have Thrive and Connect. It helps me do um, study for tests. For instance, if I if it's sixth period and I have a like ELA test in seventh period, um, I can like just go to a help session for that teacher that I have, and then I just study there, and then I'm basically prepared for the test right before. Or you could do that the day before or whatever. Um, and so yeah, and even if like let's say you have something missing in like math class, you can go to that class, talk to the teacher, and and do it during that period. It's just like an extra period to elaborate on um, your previous ones or upcoming ones to help you do better in school. Awesome. It's obvious they're fr they're thriving. Yeah, they're definitely thriving. <laughs> Good job. And hence the reason we didn't need to script anything for these guys. <laughs> really? so, absolutely. A few other students gave their uh, also provided their impact with Connect and Thrive. Ashika says Thrive and Connect is such a great learning opportunity for me. I love being able to share and collaborate with my teachers and classmates and having extra time to study or review. Fridays are also really fun because I can take a break from the week and have fun with my friends. Thrive and Connect has really been fun this year so far. We hear from Brooke who says, I like that I get extra time to study before tests so I can be more prepared. It's also good if I have unfinished work or if I'm absent because I have time to work. Also on fun Fridays, I get to go to any teacher so I can meet other ones that I don't know. And finally, we hear from Gentry who says, Connect and Thrive has impacted me because it gives me time during the day to work on projects or assignments so I don't have to do it all at home. Also, I'm attending Mr. Robinson's Boys Who Run Club so I can get to know him better because he's the track coach and I want to run track. <laughs> so Smart. it is, again, hearing directly from the mouths of the students, and that is the greatest value that we glean from this and be able to see the impact that it's truly making. So I'm going to hand it back over to Mr. Sargent for the closing. How long is it an, every day? 45 minutes? Um, and so, again, the stars of our show that are, that are here and the students that represented the Santa very well, we're just very fortunate to have um, the representation that, that we had here today with our young people and uh, guys, we're in good hands in, in the future. And so, um, you know, we've only been at this for about seven months with, with our Connect and Thrive program and uh, we're, we're, you know, in the continuous improvement model, we're going to continue to make it better because of the efforts of our, both of our staff and our, and our students. And I um, appreciate your time here and thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Yep. Very impressive. Okay, we're going to take a short recess, just a couple of minutes, so if you are here for the recognitions and you would like to leave, now would be the time. And then we will continue with our business. Thank you. I just love hearing those Thank kids you. talking. They're just so confident. Thank I love you. that, you know? Thank you, guys. Great job. Thanks. Great. That's a good job, guys. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, you're welcome. Okay, we're glad you're here. Thank you. We're glad you're here.
people will we'll continue with our meeting now. Um, next, we have something that we've um, added to our uh, um, agenda, a different way that we're doing public participation a little bit. We had some suggestions, and this is one of them. We're going to have a time where we're going to have public participation on agenda items. So if you're speaking to something that we are going to be voting on tonight or discussing, you can come up and you can sign up for it, I think 24 hours before, and you can come up and speak. Um, so the person I have tonight is Kathleen Craig. And um, just to, as a reminder for everybody for public participation, we now have a timer. Uh, the green light will come on when you start speaking, and it gives you three minutes. The yellow light means you have 30 seconds remaining. Flashing yellow is 10 seconds, and red means time's up. Hey, darling. That buzzer's loud. Just <laughs> real, real, real quick, I'm sorry. I think it was, it's 15 minutes. Oh, that's right. That's right. Okay. You have 15 minutes on the agenda and 24 if you're talking. Right. Yes, right. you're exactly right. Thanks. Okay. Good evening. My name is Kathleen Cranick, mm. and I'm here to share a few thoughts about the proposed revisions to the rules of conduct and public participation procedures. It seems there may be some confusion, consternation, or even maybe a petition over item seven, which notes that speakers seeking action from the board or the district should utilize the process designed to address the issues they raise. But let's be clear, this isn't a violation of the right to free speech. It's a reminder that dramatic readings at school board meetings aren't going to achieve results no matter how many times you do it. If I want a driver's license, the process in accordance with state law requires that I fill out a form, present my, driver, my birth certificate, pass a driving test, have my photo taken, pay a fee. I could instead stand in the lobby of the Department of Driver Services and just yell at the employees to give me a driver's license because I want one. I could do that every day. I could do that every month. But it won't get me a driver's license because there's a process for obtaining a driver's license and yelling at the employees isn't it. Asking my friends to submit the paperwork on my behalf isn't it either. If I want a driver's license, I need to follow the process for obtaining one. The processes for addressing divisive concepts in school curriculum or books in school media centers are dictated by laws signed by the governor just a few hundred yards from this building last spring. Some of the people in this room were there smiling and applauding, but it now seems that maybe we don't all think those laws apply to us. So item seven is the reminder. Quote, the public is urged to follow other resolution processes set forth in board policy or available at individual schools where those processes are clearly designed to address the issue to be raised. It should again be noted that public participation is not designed for this purpose. End quote. I for one appreciate your efforts to specify the purpose of the public participation period. And I'm certain that no one is treading on us. Thank you. Okay, next we have a consent agenda. I assume everyone's read it, answer, got any questions answered. Do I have a motion to approve? So moved. Motion second. by Mike, second by Tom. All in favor? And now we have poor Larry, who always has to follow the spotlight. <clears throat> the saying always a bridesmaid, not a bride. That's right. Kind of. <laughs> Speaking of which, my daughter got, I don't know if I told you, my daughter got engaged in Amsterdam this Christmas. It's her girlfriend, and they're getting married in November. So, first of my children get married. Congratulations. Thank you. All right, Get tonight we're going to it. talk about the January 2023 financial statements. As always, we keep goal three in mind. So starting with uh, January 1st, 2023, we started the year off with um, 260, almost 261, I mean $60.5 million in cash. You can see the receipts and disbursements. Um, in total disbursements, about $52 million. Total receipts were um, 33. And we ended the month with $241.3 million. And I think about $199 million of that was sitting in the LGIP fund. So we continue to draw good interest income off that money. So revenue to date uh, on a budget of $593.5 million. We collected about $448. We're at 75.56%. This time last year, we're at 75.22. We collected almost 100%. 
So we're in good uh, straights there. I think we're at 99.7% collection rate right now for everything. So we'll see how that follows through with the rest of the year. Um, the Avalarm tax is at 97.84%. We were a little bit ahead schedule last year, 98.66, but I do believe we're still going to get close to 100% on that. On the expenses year to date, on a budget of $594.5 million, we spent about $336.7 million. Uh, right now, we spent about 57.15% of the budget. This time last year, 57.14, so we're right on schedule. Debt service cash analysis. As you can see, we've got, um, we made our first big payment out of our um, February payments. They're due. This is the time of the year where we make a large um, principal payment. You can see it's $42 million. We had, the way that we broke it down was part of the debt in the past would be paying with bond money. SPLOS 5 was out of the scenario. There was no more money in SPLOS 5 geared towards debt payment. So you can see most of the debt payment came out of the debt service LGIP account. And this is where we reserve some of that money in the general fund and SPLOS 5 uh, for the future costs and why we reduced the millage rate. Um, you can see we have about $12 million left in that account. We should be getting about $15 million in there or more to fill it back up this year. We have about $41 million left in the SPLOS 5 account. Uh, we're going to be shutting these money market accounts down because we don't need to use them anymore. And we got about $42 million in SPLOS 6. SPLOS 6 continues to come in at record levels. Um, we are probably going to collect early again like we did in SPLOS 5. What that looks like right now, I'm still playing with the numbers. So for a total of about $100 million in um, these particular accounts and um, LGLP funds. There, there was a state law that passed about that, didn't it, SPLOS, if it finishes earlier than... The norm than expected. Yeah, you can continue collecting. I can't remember if it's like two months before yeah, you can continue. Kind of yeah. Right, as yeah. long as you don't collect all the money by the end, by the end, the end of a quarter to the next quarter, right. you can still collecting. Okay. Right. This this uh, debt service payment is that an annual payment? Correct. As you notice, most of the money came out of the debt service LGIP account. In the past, you would have <laughs> seen some of the money come out of Loss Five. Next year's lost six money will kick in for some of the payments, the way we have it set up. Special revenue funds, currently we are about $16 million revised budget. What's happened is as the year goes along and more of the other budgets get approved by the state, we add them to the re revised budget amount. We started the year out with about 12.8. We're at about 16.4. Sometimes the budgets don't come in on time, like they're supposed to be ready by October 1st, but sometimes they're late sometimes, or we get additional money sent to us midterm like in January, and we had that additional funds in there. We spent about $10 million of this. We got about $5 million left. The one thing I will show you is under 4000 that $4 million we have spent, that's the, the last bit of Care Act money we're going to be spending besides the set-aside money we have right now that teacher and learning is using. So we don't have much money left at all. I think last time I heard it's an eight hundred dollars to $700,000 range maybe is left for us to spend. So we should have most of the money spent by this summer or by next end of the next year. And do we meet all our guidelines, or is that still being? Remember, they were going to put together. A you had to put aside a certain percentage for learning loss, and we did that. Yes. Okay, so that's all taken care. Yeah, of. Yeah, that was almost three million dollars, yeah. and we're down to like the last seven or eight hundred thousand of that. Under capital projects, you can see that capital projects we ended the uh, month with about twenty-seven million dollars, almost where we began. Um, school, school nutrition, we're starting to slowly. Bring that balance down. We're at about to 17.6 now on that particular balance. And that's going to slowly keep coming down every month as we go forward. On the investment summary, once again, the uh, money market accounts you see in there, we're going to try to close those out this month or next. But you can see we had about 190, uh, almost $195 million in GIP fund. Fund 200 debt service, we kept about 12 in there. 353 fund SPLOS 4 is down to about 1.6. We have plans to finish that fund out this year, so that fund should be shut down. SPLOS 5 will be around for a little while. Uh, and the SPLOS 6 funds, that's just brand new. That's just our collecting. So, and you can see the amount of interest for those particular funds, it's particularly uh, if you look at the drone fund, that brought in $752 million in one month. And last month, it was about that much as well, a little bit more, about 770. 
So as long as the rates keep up, we're going to do as much money into these LGIP funds to gather as much interest as we can. Year-to-date collections on SPLOS 6, uh, $45 million. Um, this time, previous year, it was about 42, so we're up slightly. If you look at the change the previous year, we're up a little bit over 8%, almost 9% collections for the previous year. And you can see the difference between the months. Elementary schools, this time last year, we had about $4.4 million on the banks. The activity looks normal. For the middle schools, we had about $2.06 million. Activity looks normal for this time of the year. In the high schools, we had about $5.88 million. And activity looks normal for this time of the year. So you can see the balances relatively stayed the same from year to year on these particular accounts. Overall, we have about $12.9 million in school accounts. Um, and the breakdown difference didn't change much. It's pretty much the same as it was last year. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next for action items, we have policy BCBI, public participation in board meetings with Jennifer Cratchler. Good evening. Um, before you, you have the revised policy. I'm going to read the rules of conduct and public participation procedures. These procedures are in accordance with policy BCBI and provide the rules of conduct in accordance with OCGA 20-2-58 for all board meetings. All attendees shall remember that while the meetings are open to the public, the purpose of the meeting is to conduct the business of the school system and members of the public are invited to participate only as allowed by board policy in these procedures. Number one, signs, flags, and banners are prohibited inside the board meeting room. Number two, each member of the public participating in public comment will be given three minutes to speak. The board or its chair may limit the time, the total time allotted, allocated for public participation, as well as further limit the length of individual comments during public participation at its discretion for the purpose of the efficient operation of the business of the meeting. Only residents of the school district Representatives of businesses or organizations located in the district, parents or guardians of students attending the schools of the district or school system employees may address the board during public participation. No individual or group shall be retaliated against in any manner whatsoever for speaking during public participation. The board requests that multiple speakers from a group or organization appoint a single representative to address the board. Number five, speakers may bring printed and other supporting materials. These materials shall be given to the superintendent or board chair and can be distributed to the other board members. Issues involving individual employees or individual students and penny litigation are not subject for public participation. The use of, physical, uh, the use of physically threatening remarks, comments, or conduct by speakers or members of the audience that result in a disruption of the meeting will not be allowed. And number eight, the board, will not, will, the board will not respond to comments made by the speakers during public participation unless a member of the board chooses to ask a question. Speakers should remain at the microphone while answering questions. At this time, I would like to ask the superintendent to please recommend approval of a revision policy BCBI, public participation. We recommend approval. Do I have a motion to approve? A motion by Lindsay and a second by Mike. Is there any discussion before we vote? Well, I'd just like to say that this process was <clears throat> the result of a lot of public input. Uh, we received many dozens of, of bits of uh, input and feedback, and we considered all of them, and I, I think we arrived at a consensus that serves the purpose of this meeting. So I, I want to say thank you to the staff and to all of my colleagues here for listening and I know all of us answered many emails and took many phone calls and a lot of work was put into this so thank you all I have to agree and I just I just want to say that I hope the public realize that we appreciate their participation and and that we can all have good dialogue and be civil this is a guideline but hopefully we can always have good dialogue and and be civil so with that all in favor unanimous Thank you. Thank you. 
Okay, next we have Dr. Bearden with the Floating Homestead Exemption Resolution. Okay, good evening, everyone. Just want to follow up on the conversation we had last week at our work session around a floating homestead exemption. I'm not going to read the entire thing, but I'll read uh, the, the last couple paragraphs. This resolution is that the Board of Education supports the local homeowners of Forsyth County and providing financial security for those homeowners by providing a 5% annual cap on any increase or decrease in the reassessed value of any primary homestead. Further, it be resolved that this floating homestead exemption sunset on December 31st, 2028 to evaluate the impact on Forsyth County Schools. Before I ask the board to vote, just want to say to the public, uh, all of this is, is a resolution by the Board of Education. If they approve it, it's not within the authority of the board to make this decision. This would go to our legislative delegation who would consider that. If they decide to move it forward with legislation, then ultimately the city's citizens of our community would vote whether or not to approve this measure. That vote could happen as early as next November, but if the board approves this resolution, resolution it goes to our legislative delegation and it'll be in their hands from this point forward. So with that, I'd recommend approval. Do I have a motion to approve? I would like to make a motion to approve this floating homestead exemption resolution. Okay, do I have a second? Second. Okay, any discussion? I just want to say thank you to Dr. Bearden and for um, Mr. Larry Hamill for their work on this. I know that this has been a long discussion. I think it's a discussion that I first started having back in the early spring of 2020 before COVID. Uh, I think it's going to help out a lot of our taxpayers in our county. I think this is really going to help them out. I think that uh, I always go back to, I think it was about this time last year, when Dr. Salone came up to us and talked to us about the new hires. And she said that we had 58 new hire teacher contracts that were withdrawn, not because they didn't want to teach in Forsyth County. It's because they couldn't afford to live in Forsyth County. And this board has no control over the amount of a house and how much it's worth and what it's paying. But we do with our taxation. And so this helps that it helps make affordable taxation for Forsyth County. And so I'm excited about this. Um, this is, I think, historic for the board, school board, to have a taxation cap in, in place. And so I want to thank Dr. Bearden again and uh, Larry Hamill and the, the rest of the board members for their work and, and uh, good questions to get us to this point. Yeah, I'd just like to add, this was this was a really robust process. We went back and forth for, it felt like a very long time. Uh, we looked at all the numbers, the potential impacts. Larry was good enough to run scenarios for us. And I'm very comfortable with the 5% cap, particularly on the downside as well. And the sunset provision, which, you know, I think we do need to stop and take a look back after this has run its course for some time and evaluate the impacts. But again, we've been very deliberate, very careful looking at the tax digest. And I think all of us, I, I believe, I'll speak for myself, I, I believe it's a, a safe measure and a good guardrail for our taxpayers. And we want our teachers to live here. We want our first responders to live here. And this will pre prevent any big fluctuations in their cost of living. Anybody yeah. else? And a big thanks to Larry and, and working with the other county members. We had to work with the tax assessor board and get looking at the digest. And we had that presentation last meeting about the digest and what it would mean to us. And that's what we were waiting on. We don't want to just react to a, a change in the digest like last year, but we want to study it and understand. And that's what we've done. So we've done our due diligence. This is our decision. We're going to send it to the state delegation who has the authority to start working on that and see where they take that. So thanks. Anybody else? You good? Okay, all in favor? Can you ask, can I, can you ask a Unanimous. Question? Can you explain something? Do you mind if I ask the sunset rule? The, the date, and I'm, I'm kind of confused on the 2028. First of all, we, we, we shouldn't be doing this, but, but, let me, but, but, I, but I think that's a great question, and I, I think citizens need to understand that. The re we've never had a floating homestead exemption on our school taxes before. Obviously, the charge of this Board of Education is to provide a quality education to all of our students, and we want to make sure we didn't put something in place four or five years down the road and go, oh no, I wish we had not had done that and it's permanent, H how do we fix it? So we wanted to put a sunset so we could evaluate what was the actual impact on our finances and on our students to make sure it was the right thing to do. That was the only reason for a sunset. Give us a chance to analyze it after a few years. Okay, yeah. Okay, we voted, right? Yes. Okay. Okay, points of information. 
Mike. Yes. So I'll be providing the board a, uh, a brief, I'll try to be brief, there is a ton of, of stuff on the, uh, on the legislative docket this year, but a uh, brief update on the K-12 budget from the General Assembly and as uh, a brief update on a highlight of education related bills moving through the General Assembly. I just want to start by saying that <clears throat> this is not an endorsement by the board of any of these bills. We're not involved in this process, in that process. We don't vote on these, on these bills. We're sim I'm simply reporting back to the board uh, bills and, and legislative actions that we may need to respond to in, uh, in a short amount of time. So I'll start with the budget. It's another good year for the budget. Uh, the governor has committed to fully funding QBE. Um, there's two tax credits coming to taxpayers, $500 for a tax refund and $500 for a property tax refund. So a total of 1,000 for, for taxpayers. The governor has allocated an additional uh, 745 million in the 2023 amended budget and 1.1 billion for 2024. Um, $2,000 in teacher pay raises, which is, is great. So that's another 2,000 be besides what we did last year. And the governor has allocated $15 million in grants for Parapro to teacher grants, which we think is, is gonna be great for our system. And a $60,000 school safety grant per school. So that'll be monies that are allocated specifically for school safety. There's a $27 million allocation to increase the ratio of uh, students and counselors, 25 min uh, million set aside for COVID learning loss, and once again, uh, fully funding the HOPE scholarship program. So this is just, the budget is hundreds of pages long. This is just a highlight, but we're, I think I'll speak for myself. I think it's a, it's a good budget. I don't know if anyone has any, any commentary on that, but we're certainly seeing some positive signs. I did speak again today with members of the delegation, and they're they're telling me that we should have the insurance, uh, the insurance, the increase in insurance premiums for classified employees should be covered this year. Something that we we're we're quite concerned about. So you know, we'll believe it when we see it, but we we're hearing that it's going to happen. So that's that's a good sign. So that's an update on the budget. Just go. I'm going to run through just some major some some bills moving through the the House and the Senate. HB 32 moving through the House. So all, all of these, I just want to clarify, these bills may or may not become law. They may die. They may, they may make it through the end of the process. HB 32 is, uh, is, is outlining that no high school shall participate in any sports that doesn't have instant replay. So we'll see how that goes. HB 51 uh, authorizes local boards of ed to use uh, methods of transport other than school buses. So I'm not sure if everyone's happy about that or not, but it's on the docket. HB 111. Uh, provides for a pilot program to, in, uh, to implement the student-based funding recommendations of the 2015 Education Reform Commission. So it's a, a look at modifying QBE, and they're, they're looking at a, a pilot program to see how that works. We'll see, we'll see how that evolves. HB 148 is a program to support recruitment of teachers by providing grants to be paid by public schools to student teachers who successfully complete their student teaching requirements. So putting some money behind uh, retention and recruitment. And then HB 338 provides for inclusion of methods for the promotion of safe and appropriate use of technology and responsible digital citizenship, which I think would, would be great. Senate Bill 32, known as Alyssa's Law, it's requiring local education agencies to implement a mobile panic alert system, uh, which will coordinate all the, the, the various emergency response uh, uh, groups. SB 88. It relates to general provisions regarding parent and child relationship, so as to prohibit certain actions by adults acting in local parentis within the context of a school. SB 154 relates to the sale or distribution of harmful materials to minors, so that to provide the provisions of code section 1612-103 shall be applicable to all libraries operated by schools. This is one that we're gonna watch. And SB 170, provide for the qualification and selection of students to advise the State Board of Education and local boards of education. So that should be interesting to see how that pans out. So that's a quick update. There are many more bills than this, but this is some high-level stuff. Thank you. It's a good report. It's good to keep up with what, what they're doing down there. Okay. I had we'll one other question oh. about points of information. It kind of keyed a thought. The monthly attendance report, we always look at it, and it's there. Um, maybe by the end of the school year, we think about doing a kind of pre-COVID to current day assessment of our attendance and what it's looking like to see how healthy we've become post-COVID, just to kind of get an idea of, are we back to normal? Yeah, that's a great idea. We can do that. Okay, we'll take a um, two-minute recess if anybody needs to leave or um, before we do the public participation, the, the non-agenda public participation. Some of our employees will 
Some of them might want to go. Not yeah. while we're doing. All right. We're good. is how easy should it be for kids to get graphic sexual content? Here's the problem that the graphic sexual content promoters don't understand as they giggle at people reading racy book passages that would be prohibited in any other professional setting. In the name of sexual exploration, by a kids, few kids that may be ready, or think they're ready, to engage with graphic sexual content, they're threatening most kids and parents that are not ready. Parents who are vigilant in avoiding TV and filtering the internet at their home and putting parental controls on their kids' phones are now faced with another challenge. Monitor every book in your school library. On the other hand, parents who want to trans their kids or expose them to pornography or the latest woke novel written by a victim of child abuse explaining how they became queer thanks to parents that neglected them have a much easier time. All they have to do to allow their children the fullness of perversion and depravity that exists is nothing. Porn will flow through the unfiltered internet, on smartphones, in adult public libraries, on the TV, with no extra effort on anyone's part. And with all due respect to teachers who have spent years earning their degrees and studying methods of education or keeping up with the latest psychological trends, you do not have the right to decide that any child, other than your own, is ready for graphic sexual content. Even if you're right and the child is perfectly ready and capable to read about deviant kink, rape, sex torture, and pedophilia without experiencing trauma, it is not your decision and it is not professionally acceptable. If a teacher believes that a child must be exposed to graphic sexual content because without presenting them with graphic bestiality or incest or MILFs or that the child will somehow be harmed, then they need to clear it with the parents first. And if the parents don't agree after earnest attempts of persuasion, they have to honor the parents' right to decide. Of course, some parents are a danger to their children, and this presents special problems. Just recently, prominent LGBTQ activists in Georgia, William and Zach Zulock, were caught raping their two adopted boys from ages 6 to 11. These two predators were able to get away with grooming and sexualizing innocent children and even prostituting them out to other pedophiles for years. And because they wrapped themselves in the banner of diversity, inclusion, and equity, nobody caught them until Google found pictures of them raping their children on the account of one of the people they sold their children as sex slaves to. Now certainly, conservative LGBTQ couples protect their children from overt sexualization and protest drag queen sh shows for their children and oppose sexually explicit content in school libraries. So just being LGBTQ doesn't mean you're endangering children. But if you're so hell-bent on making it easier for children to access sexual content without first recognizing the rights of the parents, not only are you being unprofessional, you're adding to the danger. And so on that note, thank you very much for your time. And again, I'd love to have lunch with anyone who disagrees with me. Good evening. Recently, our state senator put forth a bill that would criminalize school libraries for providing books to minors that are offensive. Now, we all know that offensive is a very subjective word. What is offensive to one may not be offensive to another. This is not a one-size-fits-all word. Now, one person among us, I'll call her Mama Bear One, is taking credit for influencing Mr. Dalzell because she sent him numerous emails and passages from books. Here's the problem with that. According to the law, it clearly says about the challenge process, when taken as a whole, that it lacks in serious literary, artistic, political, or scientific value for minors. In case you missed it, that means the whole book. Last month, Mama Bear One dramatized a passage, about six paragraphs to be exact, from What Girls Are Made Of. She never read the book. We know this absolutely. Let me tell you a little about it. The first sentence is, 
When I was 14, my mother told me there was no such thing as unconditional love. I could stop loving you at any time, my mother said. This is a teen who is looking for someone, anyone, to love her unconditionally. She thought she would find it with her parents. She thought she would find it with her boyfriend. Something else she learned. There are consequences. She once pranked a classmate and the school assigned community service. She chose to work at an animal shelter where she found a friend, Becca, who tells her there are more important things than love, something else that will give her the self-worth that she so desperately needs. Becca says, and I quote, service. With love, you're waiting around for someone to give it to you. But service, that's something you give. It doesn't matter who you serve. It's the serving that matters. Now let's get back to Mama Bear 1. Remember what I said about reading the whole book? Well, Mama Bear 1 couldn't challenge this book because it is not in the school where her child attends. That's part of the law, too. So she put out a call to anyone with a student at a high school where this book is, and she gets a response. I think we can all agree that integrity is a very important virtue to teach your kids. Probably the most important. Well, this Mama Bear tells respondent, all you have to do is take the challenge packet I've written and turn it into the principal. I've done all the work. If the book stays, then we'll appeal it to the board. I have seven packets ready to go and many more to come. In a word, this is the work of a cheater, and she has coerced an unknowing accomplice. She is manipulating principals, you, and breaking the law. We have no issues with challenges uh, going forward and a re uh, legitimate review process. Now, where did she get those passages that she uh, read from, book, from the books? From various outside sources. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next we have Jeff Torme. Is that correct, your last name? Torme. Torme? Yep. Okay. Do I need to state my name or anything? You can if you want to. Okay. That'll be well. You already fine. stated my name, and we'll just start the timer when you start. Okay. So, um, so why the books? Just a little feedback from the community here. So, kids can access stuff about being gay and trans and all that stuff online. So, why are we so concerned about having it in school? Does anyone even read them? Now, I have read some of these, and it's really not about the books. It's really about acquiescence. It's really about your submission. It's about validating behavior. And anyone who wants just normal library books in a school library is now somehow responsible for hate, which is ridiculous. Why does the word hate enter the conversation? It's to bully you into submission. It's a slur to try to gain the moral high ground So because nobody wants to be labeled as perpetuating hate. And I don't think there's much hate here. You should recognize this as just a smear tactic. And the books issue is really a Trojan horse. Once accepted, the floodgates open and the demands for acceptance of degeneracy will only increase. So where is this going? Allowing boys to, who identify as girls to use girls' changing rooms. Then it's on to gender-affirming care in schools, allowing kids to get life-changing hormone treatments, encouraging bodily mutilation by cutting off breasts and genitals. And they'll want it without parents' permission. You should know that many people of transition warn others not to do it and regret that nobody told them not to when they did. I'm old enough to remember when gays said they just wanted to come out of the closet and get married. Now we have grown men dressing as women, calling themselves drag queens, doing strip tees for children. Why children? It's called grooming. And if you don't think drag shows for kids are wrong, you've also been a victim of grooming. Speaking of grooming, we have teachers in schools around the country, not in Forsyth County, passing around dildos and butt plugs and taking satisfaction with TikTok videos showing how gay their classrooms are and how they talk to their students about their own sex life. They pledge allegiance to the gay flag and don't even have an American flag in their classroom. None of this is good for families, kids, the community, or our country. Gender dysphoria usually gets worked out when kids mature. I've seen it with, with friends of my own children. You should encourage kids to give it time and not indulge a in behavior that may, they may very well regret. You or some of the adults need to make sure the schools are not allowed to be places where the hypersexualization of kids is allowed. Get rid of the books about gay sex and trans and all the rest of it. Our society has turned into a cesspool of degeneracy, and there's no reason at all for our schools to validate it by having those books in our schools. 
Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Renee Claire Kovacs. Oh, sorry. Hi, Renee Claire Kovacs, better known as Sawyer's mom. Um, I came with one piece of technology and the DeSanta um, presentation. I really like the quote that they use, connection is the energy that exists between people when they feel seen, heard, and valued. Um, I had something I was going to talk to you guys about this month, but it's Black History Month. And I heard a very interesting preview to a podcast that was talking about Dawson, Georgia. Little place, we probably don't know. They actually tied it to President Carter's home. Hope they're doing well. Um, so what they talked about was Walter Washington. He was the first black mayor of a major city. He went on to head housing authorities, both the local district and nationally. Cole Swindell, he is a country music singer. He was nominated in 2015, actually won New Artist of the Year. And the one we probably all know, Otis Redding, sitting in the morning sun, come on. You can't participate, but you can. Uh, <laughs> he was an American singer and songwriter. On the internet, they say he's a seminal artist in soul music and rhythm and blues. All of them are from Dawson, Georgia. But how are they remembered? Walter Washington has a huge conference center in Washington, DC. Otis Redding, there's an interactive monument in Gray, Georgia. But in 2014, the Department of Transportation posted 10 street signs announcing that Terrell County is the home of Cole Swindell, where all of the state highways enter the county. The thing is that Walter Washington and Otis Redding are black. Cole Swindell is white. We see him everywhere. This matters because this is the representation of the kids in, Ter in sorry, Dawson County, Dawson, Georgia, not county. The black kids don't have a representation of themselves. They don't see it in their own history. And these people are from there. This is why diversity in education matters so much. Our kids deserve to see themselves. Representation matters. So for Forsyth County students, let's let them see themselves in all of the diverse populations that we have, that we celebrate. Happy Black History Month. Thank you. Angie Darnell. Um, okay, reading is an intimate activity, and it's usually done silently, but I am choosing to uh, read aloud a synopsis of a more detailed story from a book I've read many times, and I warn you, it is graphic, but it's about the gang rape of a young woman. After being abused and violated all night by a gang, she makes her way back to her home where she dies in the doorway, her hands clenched upon the threshold. Found by the man who gave her up to her rapists, he eventually cuts her body into 12 pieces, her body parts distributed throughout Israel. This synopsis describes a much more detailed passage contained in the Book of Judges in the Holy Bible. There are several uncomfortable scriptures in the Old Testament that I've read by a lot, including tales of incest and sexual references. 28 times there's reference to the violation of women. My point. The entirety of a book is important, even if the subject matter is uncomfortable, even if you don't like it, even if you wouldn't read it. Literature can reflect reality, stories of reality, no matter the timeline of history, are often shocking. A former fire chief and sheriff, my father, used to say, if you panic in an emergency, you're a danger to yourself and to others. I find ways to associate that with life and with this subject, literature, that's explicit reality, that's not an emergency, but the call to action against it creates one. The danger is the intimidation tactics and disinformation used affecting rights of others to read without regard to equity. The panic has been cultivated by nationally organized groups, most having only existed since 2021. 
Children are being groomed with pornography, fuzzy lines drawn between literature and pedophiles, education jargon redefined to be a conspiracy to lure parents away from understanding their children need better and more parental values. Now we have multiple book challenges being solicited asking parents to submit titles to principals. Simply submitting paperwork is not reading the entire book. A reminder, the three-point review of challenged books is federally settled law. Disinformation distributed on public school initiatives. If a book could be filed in the fiction section of a library, yet it's activated emotions to be on the front lines of a marketing strategy to affect trust in public education and practice an ironic attempt to make diversity and inclusion prejudicial. That's an agenda, not a righteous cause. You now receive emails if your child checks out a library book. Problem solved. Demanding control over what others read infringes on rights. That's just a simple fact. And if little fires everywhere continue to be set by those activated to panic, it's the job of the board and of the people like us to dispel propaganda, not perpetuate it by giving those flames oxygen. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Anita Tucker. <coughs> Good evening, board. Thank you for letting me speak to you today. Um, I'm the parent of a son who attended Forsyth County Schools from first grade. He graduated in 2021. He is now finishing his second year at Georgia State University. You can tell I'm a proud mama. My son would make you all proud. He is making good decisions and advocating for himself and others. He takes responsibility for his actions and holds others accountable including his parents. Every day, I am amazed and impressed by the mature, independent thinking he presents to the world. He is a responsible, caring human being. I thank Forsyth, Forsyth County Schools for your contribution to this amazing person's journey. It would not be possible without the diversity in the schools and the expansive curricula he was taught. He grew up around kids with different viewpoints, and he learned to appreciate the differences. I recall the many, many, many consent forms I had to fill out for him to watch certain educational videos and to read books that some may consider objectionable. Forth Forsyth County Schools has a strict and transparent policy that allows parents to decide what their children can be exposed to in the classroom. No left turn in education and others are national, nationwide groups that are pushing an agenda. That agenda is to persuade parents into supporting so-called school choice. What that means is that they are pushing to divert tax dollars to pay for privatizing public schools. The ultimate goal is to turn public education into a private educational system run by for-profit corporations. Diverting tax dollars away from public schools creates a two-tier educational system, as has been demonstrated in New Orleans. The communities that have resources will get a quality education. Communities without the resources will suffer, and that is a proven fact. Georgia's Constitution, Article 8, Section 1, Public Education reads, Paragraph 1, Public, public Education. Free public education prior to college or post-secondary level support by taxation. The provision of an adequate public education for the citizens shall be a primary obligation of the state of Georgia. Public education for the citizens prior to the college or post-secondary level shall be free and shall be provided by taxation. This is non-negotiable. I kindly ask outside groups with a, a political agenda to undermine our trust in schools and school boards to move on. You are not welcome here. Thank you. Next, we have Melissa Clink.
My name is Melissa Klink, and I'm a community leader in Forsyth County. At the last meeting, we were all stuck listening to an odd vagina monologue where a snippet about having an orgasm was acted out to the board. Since that writing was a quality choice, an award winner, in fact, a black woman jokingly asked what the name of the book was, which was met with laughter that broke the awkwardness of the performance that belonged in the Focal Center rather than at the school board. Her reaction to that question is what brought me here today. There were two different black women in the room at the last meeting. Two women who have different life stories, struggles, different parts of the country where they grew up, different vocabularies. The reader displayed her inherent implicit bias by being visibly displeased and aggressive in nature towards the wrong black woman. You see, the black woman she assigned the voice to she heard had said nothing. But that black woman had just spoke to the board, and that black woman had locks. While no one got hurt last month as a result of the white woman's obvious display of her own bias, erasing my friend's actual voice and replacing it with another's, implicit bias is very harmful inside and outside of these four walls. Implicit bias is a form of bias that occurs automatically and unintentionally and nevertheless affects judgments, decisions, and behaviors. Humans have a tendency to make judgments based on prejudice and assumptions rather than indisputable facts and data. Bias causes harm to recruitment and retention in the workforce. In education, bias looks like assuming students from certain backgrounds or social groups have predetermined set of intellectual ambitions. Students who speak with accents are sometimes assumed to be poor writers, and students with substandard writing abilities may be stereotyped as lacking academic ability. In healthcare, non-white patients refer receive fewer cardiovascular in interventions and fewer kidney transplants. Black women are more likely to die after being diagnosed with breast cancer. Georgia has the worst maternal mortality rate of any state in the country. Black women in Georgia are 3.3 times more likely to die from pregnancy-related complications than white women. Bias feeds into each of these outcomes. To combat bias, corporations, institutions, et cetera, need to be actively conscious of and reflect on the impact, not the intent of the bias. Diversity, equity, and inclusion training offers examples of bias and ways to improve our reactions to them. I ask that the board reinstate its diversity, equity, and inclusion program in regard to all faculty members and integration of its principals in its classrooms. Pretending that bias does not exist perpetuates the harm it accomplishes outside of this building. It is the same kind of cultural blindness that would cause a Cuban father to ask the board to see his children as white and to erase their own heritage one year ago in this room. We are charged with shaping children better than the generation before them and continuing to improve our world to be more equitable and more just. Thank you for your time and happy Black History Month. Next, we have Cindy Martin. <clears throat> Ma'am, I cut out what I wanted to say about that. You probably can't even sell that phone, can you? Oh, my God. Uh, sure. This is just to speak to us, okay? Yeah. They were all insulting me. I think I should be able to say something back. This is a book challenge packet that I created to challenge the sexually explicit books. It's about 40 pages. It states um, all the explicit content, including pages and pages of excerpts. It states why the books counter, uh, counter our uh, sex education curriculum and it contradicts it, and why the books don't align with our five-year strategic plan. This was rejected. Why? because the challenge form requires that a parent also write an essay. This form states, quote, referencing the three points in the law, so it's a three-point essay, discuss in detail how you perceive this work as a whole is harmful to minors. This packet has 40 pages of book content and facts, yet it was rejected because I did not include a subjective essay. Who's the person who's deliberately making this difficult for parents? That's my question. Members of the board, I am formally requesting that you instruct the superintendent to uh, remove this essay requirement or make it optional. Now I'm going to continue with reading you a book from our library. This is a book about child pedophilia. And don't tell me I'm making, taking it out of context because the school database description says, Jimmy struggles for survival, mourning the loss of a girl he met through a kitty porn website. That's in our school database. Page 89. To access the more disgusting and forbidden websites, 
Craig uses his uncle's private code. He went to Hot Trots, a global sex trotting website. This is how he first saw her. She was only about eight years old. She didn't have a name. She was just another little girl on a porno site. She was small boned and exquisite and naked like just the, just the other little girls with, excuse me, she was just like the other little girls on the porno site and naked like the rest of them with nothing on her but a garland of flowers and a pink hair ribbon. These were frequent props on the sex kitty sites. She was on her knees with another little girl on either side of her, positioned in front of a man pretending to be shipwrecked on an island of delicious midgets. The act involved whipped cream and a lot of licking. The effect was both innocent and obscene. The three little girls were going over the guy with their kittenish tongues and their tiny fingers, giving him a thorough workout to the sound of moans and giggles. Thank you. Next, Mark Weiss Wise, which is, it doesn't matter, Wise. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. First of all, I'd like to thank Wes McCall for telling school board superintendent no on his resolution to upgrade the um, exemptions on seniors. I'd also like to thank Mike for saying no there too, that he will not support it. We have three board members who haven't spoken. The only thing I can think is they support raising the age limit. Second thing is, Citizen Foresight Committee. I looked to the members on there. That's Morris, Christy Morrison and Buddies. When Christy was school board superintendent, if the school board superintendent told her that what he wanted, she would do. They are his yes group. I would like that group to be dissolved, 100%. Second thing, on your public participation, let me say this much. If I went to Foresight County BOC, I could walk up to the door right before the meeting, sign up, and they will listen to you. As long as you're a citizen in this county and a taxpayer, they understand this is the only time we get to sit in front of you guys to speak one-on-one -on -one and get your underdivided attention. According to the email from him, he doesn't care about us. I'm going to use your buzzword, community. It's basically the citizen of Foresight County and the, and the taxpayers. His email out there does not care about us. He doesn't even want us out here. This rule 24 hours before you have to, you have to register is ridiculous. Basically, you have to be a member of the school, your system, the school system. If you're a resident of this county, you should listen. You are representing the citizens of this county, the board members. The constituents are the citizens. You are a civil servant. The taxpayers pay your salary. That's who you answer to. They're your employees. Whoever wrote this, Joseph Stalin and Joseph Gerber, these people would be on their policies, writing their policies. This is how bad this is. I'm asking you to, you already voted on it. But it's ridiculous. Any citizen should be able to come up here and speak to you one on one. And thank you, Wes, and thank you, Mike, for telling him no. Thank you. Okay, that concludes our public participation. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Motion by Mike. Second. Second by Lindsay. All in favor? Thank you. Thank you.